Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back for another interesting session on Doctor Speak. Hope all of you are safe and doing well with your families. Before we start today's session, I would like you to click on the like button and let me know if I'm audible, whether you're being able to hear me clearly. You can also type in the city you're from in the comments box. That would be very helpful for us to know which city you hail from. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about this initiative. You should be taking maximum advantage of this initiative. Spread the word to your friends, colleagues at work, with your family, as you get to know the first-hand information from the medical experts of top-notch institutions of the country. I guess we have some comments coming in, and we are good to start. Okay, let me tell you a little bit about this initiative, which is Doctor Speak. Doctor Speak is our unique initiative. We launched it in the month of July through a 12-episode series of live sessions. In these sessions, we have expert doctors who come in from the different fields of specializations, and they uh, address the audience. They talk to them about different relevant topics and educate them about the different diseases which are there, how they can be prevented, and they also answer the queries that the audience may have, any queries or concerns that one may have. It is an extremely insightful and uh, engaging session. Till date, we've conducted a, a variety of sessions in which we've covered a few topics on mental health. There is uh, an interesting one on skin and healthcare. We've done. We've done something around cancer, and the last one I guess we had done was on ear, nose, and throat problems. So today's topic. Let's get back uh, now on today's topic. We all know that monsoon is around the corner and it's already there. In fact, it's monsoon season right now. And with the monsoon, we have the joy of, you know, steaming pakodas, hot, hot chai. But it also brings with it a lot of vector and waterborne diseases like malaria and dengue. There are water clogged areas. There are abandoned containers which are just lying around. There are poor hygiene facilities in the country, poor sanitation. And all these become mosquito breeding grounds and they cause the spread of these deadly diseases and with the current pandemic today it's very difficult to differentiate between a regular fever which may come due to dengue malaria or just a viral fever or a fever which would come due to the big virus covid so how do you differentiate between these vector borne diseases how do you differentiate between uh, what if it's linked to covid or due to just a water borne disease so today's session, we'll be covering this very special topic. This special topic is on malaria and dengue, especially in children. It's with Dr. Shetty. Dr. Shetty is from Nanavati Max Super Speciality Hospital. She's a pediatric consultant and a neonatologist and practicing pediatric uh, with a experience, rich experience of close to 27 years. She's an MDDS in, and a PD in pediatrics with expertise in speci and specialization in neurology and rheumatology. Good evening, doctor, and welcome to our live session on Doctor Speak. Yeah, thank you for uh, your introduction. Okay. Thank you so much yeah, for joining us, doctor, for taking out time from your busy schedule. I know it's in the middle of the afternoon, but uh, we are extremely eager to hear what you have to tell us today. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I'm also very happy to join here. Yes. You are uh, a very Dr. good person. You are providing everyone, helping people for the knowledge sharing base. Right. Anyway, let's start the topic. Yes, uh, doctor, I will tell you uh, the flow of the session. Uh, you yeah. can speak about this topic once you're done with your talk, once you're done with your presentation. We'll come back to you with question and answers. We Usually we have a lot of question and answers which come in from our audience. We'll come back to you. Yeah. So I would request everybody in the audience kindly put in your questions and Dr. Shetty would address it post her talk with us. So thank yeah. you once again, doctor, and over to you. Thank you. Uh, today's topic is vector borne disease and COVID-19. When the patient enters into our cabin, the parents are so anxious about even the 99 degree fever. Are we dealing with the COVID? But in the presence of the monsoon here with uh, all other unhygienic Indian monsoon, we are facing other vector borne diseases too. So 
I'm here to help you out. Just differentiate the signs and symptoms. What are the important symptoms of the other symptoms? We are, I'm here to help you out. Next, next slide. Fine. It is a frightening time. We are in the midst of worldwide pandemic. With many places at least partially shut down, others are struggling to reopen safely. Some of us are in an area where the coronavirus infection rates are getting worse. Other are bracing for what may come next. And all of us are watching the headlines and wondering, when is this going to end? It is not uncommon to have a fever in a monsoon. Hospital beds are full due to vector borne disease and exaggerated unrealistic fear of fever expressed by parents and caregivers. So I am here to brief you all regarding the common illness in monsoon. How can you protect yourself, understand the symptoms of vector borne disease and how they are different from the COVID infection? So let us start from the scratch. What is the vector borne disease? Vector borne disease, disease that results from an infection transmitted to human and other animals by blood feeding anthropods, such as mosquitoes, ticks, and fleas. For example, chikungunya, dengue fever, malaria, plague, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, typhus, West Nile virus, Zika virus. There are so many and other so many other diseases also there, but these are which are common we see in our routine practice. How do mosquitoes spread the disease? Mosquitoes spread the disease through their bites. Mosquitoes are vectors. So many viruses are there. They cannot just transmit like a airborne disease. They just, just cannot enter in our body. They need some vehicle to enter our body. The vector often carry the infection through blood. When mosquito bites, it is not only suck the blood, but secretes saliva. This saliva enters your blood. There is an exchange of fluids between the mosquito and your bloodstream. Mosquito becomes infected when it feeds off a person or animal with the disease. It then passes the infection on when it bites. The mosquito often feed a method called a sip feeding. This means that a mosquito does not suck all the blood it needs from the one source. It takes a multiple meal from the multiple source. And unfortunately, this exposes more people to infection. I know it's a dirty picture to show, but still. Uh, it is mosquito. This mosquito is responsible for the dengue infection. Okay, and the characteristic of this mosquito, it can suck three times of his body weight. That much blood at a time, he can suck, but he can go for the sip feeding also. See, when any mosquito bite human, they cannot prick directly. They just prick, but they may not get the capillary around the same prick. So they keep pricking in a various direction. And that is the reason we are getting a little hump, itchy sensation and uh, uh, swelling at the local area of a bite. Once they release, when they prick, there will be the negative suction and the blood will suck in their tummy. When any prick happens, at that time, the capillary tend to block. So the mosquito release their saliva and that saliva has a heparin like substance which prevent the clotting. So the easy flow of a blood. But in exchange, that saliva contains a viruses which we all are scared of. And that viruses are responsible for giving us infection. This is Anopheles mosquito. Anopheles mosquito also is the method is same of sucking also and transmitting infection. Malarial parasite, which is spread by Anopheles mosquito. 
and this mosquito after sucking the blood and releasing the parasite parasite will enter into the blood vessels and go to the liver liver they metabolize they multiply also and if any person is a strong or the powerful immunity they remain dormant even for a year but as early as possible in 2 to 3 days they may show the infection yeah i love history so let me tell you something about the history and past of the malaria and dengue they are very old illness you know in uh, qin dynasty one encyclopedia the malaria and the dengue like symptoms they have described in one encyclopedia and at that time they said it's a water poison during that time every each and every illness is a curse of a god so everyone was thinking in that term and they left the patient untreated like that people started dying so much and at that time no one was bothered about the treatment part but only thing is a curse of god even the same uh, type of symptoms they have mentioned in spanish literature also and in the african literature also and they name the disease ki denga so this is very old even in ad 2035 this is first reported very old illness but we are still struggling with the say disease like this how do i prevent mosquito bite although as i said it is a very old uh, disease but still we don't have any vaccines the so only therapy only thing is left is the prevention you just take care of yourself by preventing the mosquito bites mosquito bites can be prevented in several ways this includes eliminating any standing water if at all you cannot eliminate that standing water pour oil or kerosene on top of it which prevent a mosquito to sit on it not to tra travel to an infected area wearing a bug spray registered with epa typically contain deet wearing full sleeves clothes long pants and light color cloth utilize the screening over the windows and doors staying indoor during the highest point of the mosquito activity treating clothes tent and net covering with a chemical that repels the mosquito sleeping under protective netting if possible the house furniture should be selected which should be the light in color please try to over crowding of a furniture nature you should avoid that helps the mosquito and then uh, that is also the mosquito will go and hide behind the fur furniture so try to avoid that if possible it is difficult to say in a mumbai but in other part of the india you can always try this method uh what i said before it is just you can protect yourself for the mosquito bite but this method i am telling you which is a use of the chemical and biological method to kill the mosquito this method is on the larger scale see after the world war 2 uh, there are lots of malaria and the dengue almost uh, people they have not died in a war they died because of the malaria and dengue so it was very life threatening and people were worried about it so they have started using a ddt and bha which is proven to be very effective in killing mosquito and uh, the entire container they used to spread like totally all over the floor all over the ground soil everywhere is the second layer of a soil is a ddt but it have been banned since last 15 years due to the chemical hazards even it is banned since 15 years till today's date we can see the traces of ddt in a soil even water even vegetables fruits it's everywhere it is a carcinogenic so we have shifted from that method 
to the biological method. It is a little slow, but very helpful method. So uh, the theory is what a mosquito lays the egg in a stagnant water. Okay. And after a few days, the larva, hatch, uh, larva hatches from the eggs. And that larva are aquatic. No? So we introduce a larvae eating fish like gambosia, minos and trout. So when a larva comes out of the egg, this fish will start eating them. They feed on this mosquito larvas. A second along with the fish, second measure as we can introduce an aquatic bird like ducks. They also eat the larva. Even some plants like Eutricularia, it is infective orus plant. So they eat larva also. This method is quite popular if you have a backwater or the dirty water surround and in the government permits, these methods are really useful. At least it will not give us any side effects of uh, uh, chemicals. In spite of our all the measures, we do get this infection. So let us see how the symptoms of malaria and dengue. Yeah, this uh, uh, disease, as I said, it's a very old disease. Still also, we have not made any vaccines to protect ourselves. A developed country, they say okay, this is disease of a dirty people. It's because you cannot maintain the hygiene, you better get this disease. So they are not helping much in a vaccine production. Even in USA, the certain part, they have made the vaccines and it is a common in that area, but there is a limitation of that vaccines. You can give the vaccines only after the nine years of age and, and you should suffer once from the dengue infection. Written lab test should be there with us because if you have taken the vaccines and if you have not suffered with dengue, if at all, if you get the second time of dengue infection, it will be the life threatening. So this vaccine is lots of side effects and limitations. We don't count this as a vaccine for the routine use. And they don't give any travelers and they, we don't even take the vaccine um, in a consideration. So let's talk about the symptoms of malaria. Uh, here I am not going in a detail of uh, uh, hemorrhagic malaria or the complications of malaria because this I am giving you the basic information about the malaria. The signs and symptoms of malaria typically begin at 8 to 25 days following the infection. But they may occur later in those who have taken the anti-malarial medication as a prevention. The symptoms of malaria are unique. They are divided into three stages. Cold stage, hot stage and the wet stage. Cold stage is associated with the shivering and chilling. An infected individual feels cold. Even the blanket does not seem to be helpful. This stage is due to the rupture of RBC. As I explained earlier, the parasite enter into the liver, they multiply, release into the bloodstream again, and they try to enter into RBCs. That is a red blood cells. After entering into the RBC, they again start multiplying and they rupture the RBC. At that time, a person who is suffering from the disease will feel the severe cold and shivering. Second stage is the hot stage. As the name tells us, the temperature rises. It can go up to 106 degree Fahrenheit. Along with the high temperature, there is an increased work of breathing and high pulse rate. This fever is caused due to release of hemozoins from the RBC. This is a pyrogen, so it causes a high-grade fever. And third come to wet stage. 
in this stage the temperature gets to normal with sweating clothes are completely drenched into the sweat this are the unique fever pattern after the malarial fever attack patient feels completely weak exhausted and pale this type of fever cycle comes once in 24 hours or 48 hours if patient left untreated they may enter into the complication zone and it may lead to death if you check the statistics the death rate of malaria is significantly high here is a just a description about a short description about a malaria symptoms central headache systemic fever muscular fatigue pain back pain skin chills and sweating both respiratory dry cough enlargement of spleen stomach nausea and vomiting so the headache is there in malaria also it will be there in a dengue also it will be there in a covid also but when you have a idea about the fever pattern you can make out this could be other than covid it could be malaria also now i have not discussed much about the complications of malaria because i am sure the nowadays in a panic situation with a one or two days of fever you will definitely contact your pediatrician or the physician symptoms of dengue a typically people infected with a dengue virus are asymptomatic 80% or have a mild symptoms such as uncomplicated fever others have more severe illness is 5% and in a small portion it is a life threatening so if you see all the percentage wise statistics only 5% of the dengue will go into the severe zone of complicated zone the incubation period a time between you expose yourself to the mosquito and virus enter into your body and the onset of symptoms it ranges from 3 days to 14 days but most often it is a 4 to 7 days a children often experience symptoms similar to those of common cold and gastrointestinal and have a greater risk of severe complications though initial symptoms are generally mild but include a fever which is high grade a children less than 10 years of age and the old people senior citizen they are at a risk of uh, complications the characteristic symptoms of dengue are sudden onset of fever headache headache is typically in a dengue is a retro orbital uh, pain the person who wants to sleep all the time because they are unable to open the eyes too much heaviness behind the eyes they have a muscle pain they have a joint pain and the rash and the alternative name of a dengue fever is brick bone fever comes from the associated pain which is muscle pain and the joint pain the course of infection is divided into three phase febrile phase critical phase and the recovery phase here you can see this headache is there in a malaria also headache is there in a dengue also malarial headache is always the central headache and uh, dengue headache is headache is there but significant retro orbital uh, pain which is pain behind the eyes now we'll talk about the febrile phase in a dengue the febrile phase involve the high grade fever potentially 1 not 4 degree fahrenheit 
and is associated with a generalized pain and headache. This usually lasts for two days to seven days. Nausea, vomiting may also occur. After three to four days, the rash begins to appear, which occur in 50 to 80 percent of those with the symptoms in a first of a second days. At least it will start with a flushed skin or after three, four days later in the course of the illness, they develop a rashes, which is similar to measles rash. A rash we can describe as an island of white in a sea of a red. Some petechi, small red spots, which that do not disappear when the skin is pressed. Usually a significant uh, dengue rash, they blanches on the pressure. So if you press your fingers on the patient's rash, when you take your hands up, you can see your finger marks. So there are blanches on the pressure. But if they have a petechi, that small petechi hemorrhagic area beneath the skin, it will not blanch. Uh, as may some mild bleeding from the mucous membrane of a mouth and nose happens if you have not taken any treatment or consulted any doctors and the platelet has dropped down significantly, then the mucous membrane bleeds comes. The fever usually happens classically as a biphasic fever or the saddleback in nature, breaking and then returning for a one or two days. Here, fever comes usually twice or thrice in a day. It is not like a malaria, which malaria usually comes in a once in a 24 hours or 48 hours sometimes. Now we are talking about the critical phase. In some people, disease proceeds to the critical phase as fever resolves. So when Usually when the patient, we admit the patient, the relative is okay, fever has gone. Can we take the discharge? But the critical phase starts once the fever is gone. During this period, there is a leakage of plasma from the blood vessels. You know, in our blood vessels, usually nothing leaks out. But in when the patient is suffering from the dengue, the capillary permeability increase and the plasma started oozes out from the capillary or the blood vessels, which lasts for one or two days. It makes the blood thick. This may result in a fluid accumulation in a chest, abdominal cavity, as well as a depletion of the fluid from the circulation. So the blood, there are fluid everywhere, okay? But it is not there where it should be. So blood vessels are the thick concentrated blood in a blood vessels and the rest area, the cavity, they have chest or abdominal cavity. They are completely filled with the fluids. Decreased blood supply to the vital organs because blood has become so thick, fluidity is reduced. There may also be the organ dysfunctions and severe bleeding starts, typically from the gastrointestinal tract. So when it happened in because of the high grade fever, the patient is not eating properly, taking medications to take care of the fever, they start vomiting. And your mucosa is so sensitive. So if at all you vomit one or twice the patient vomits, they start bleeding. When you have entered into the critical phase of dengue. The shock, dengue shock syndrome and hemorrhagic dengue uh, fever occur in a less than 5% of all cases of dengue. However, those who have previously been infected with other serotype of a dengue or a secondary infections are at the increased risk. This critical phase, while rare, but occur relatively quite common in a pediatric age group. 
सो लेट मी टेल यू वन थिंग एस आई एक्सप्लेन प्रीवियसली द डेंग्यू वॉज वेरी डेंग्यू इज अ वेरी ओल्ड इलनेस यू कैन से टू हंड्रेड एंड थर्टी फाइव एडी दैट फर्स्ट रिपोर्ट ऑफ अ डेंग्यू फीचर सीन बट डेंग्यू हेमरेज एक फीवर एंड शॉक सिंड्रॉम they just is a 50 years old matlab it's is come in a literature and it's more into everyone's um we can say we are seeing that case since last 50 years only so it's quite recent if you compare it with the dengue infection which is very old infection okay I mean, now we will talk about the recovery phase. A recovery phase occurs next. If the patient is untreated and is lucky enough not to have a, a dengue shock syndrome or in a hemorrhagic fever, and into the self-recovery phase with the resolution of the liquid fluid into the blood stream, this usually lasts in two to three days. the improvement is often striking and can be accompanied with severe itching slow heart rate another rash may occur with maculopapular or a vasculitis appearance and this type of rash means the skin peeling will start excessive area of the dry patch rough skin we can say it's a sand paper type of a, a feel so the vasculitic appearance okay fine which is followed by the peeling of skin during this stage the fluid overload state may occur if it affects the brain because fluid is overloaded edematous brain at that time a reduced level of consciousness the patient will behave little confused prefer to stay alone doesn't want to talk much and involve and convulsions a feeling of fatigue and excessive tiredness and this type of tiredness last for a weeks in a adult we can say the senior citizens so there are uh, uh, just a picture of dengue symptoms here the febrile phase sudden onset of fever with headache mouth and nose bleeding muscle and joint pain vomiting and rash diarrhea critical phase fall in a blood pressure the fluid into the lungs which is known as a pleural effusion fluid in the abdomen cavity known as a ascites gastrointestinal bleed as i said when the patient vomit something the bleeding will start it is not a profuse bleeding in the bleed vomitus you can see the flu streaks of the bleed but if you are enter into the bad stage with the severely low platelet count then bleeding will be little more than a blood streaks recovery phase is altered sensorium level confusion seizures and itching because of the severe dry skin and drying up of rashes covid 19 covid 19 symptoms of covid 19 everyone is absolutely graduate from uh, a whatsapp university so nothing much to say about the covid 19 symptoms but just let me tell you uh, a little scientific reasons and uh, proper uh, symptoms of the covid 19 symptoms of covid 19 are variable ranging from a mild symptoms to severe illness common symptoms including headache loss of smell taste nasal congestion runny nose cough muscle pain sore throat fever diarrhea and the breathing difficulty people with the same infection may have a different symptoms and their symptoms may change over a time now the three clusters of the symptoms have been identified a respiratory symptoms musculoskeletal symptoms and digestive symptoms if you see the respiratory symptoms you have a cough 
cold, sputum, shortness of breath, and low grade fever. Initial symptoms is quite similar to a flu like symptoms. But lots of a test and smell, it is a characteristic of this COVID virus. Second comes to the musculoskeletal symptoms. In this symptoms, the muscle pain, joint pain, headache, and fatigue comes. Digestive system clusters with abdominal pain, little lift, diarrhea, and vomiting. Any, uh, we have seen that in a same family, everyone is suffering from the COVID infection. They have a different type of a symptom. Some people have a respiratory symptoms. Some have a musculoskeletal system. Some have a mixture of both. And some are present with only abdominal pain and vomiting. So this all depend upon your own immune system as well as the health pattern. In people without prior ear, nose or throat disorders, a loss of test combined with the loss of smell is nothing but a COVID-19 infection. If someone is a known case of allergic disorders, they keep complaining of runny nose and sputum in pandemic when we were at a height of our COVID admissions. At that time, we have a little more confusion about are we dealing with flu or we are dealing with COVID-19. But when it is associated with the loss of taste and uh, smell, it is nothing but the COVID along if you are also an allergic person. Of people who show the symptoms, 81% develop only mild to moderate symptoms or even say mild pneumonia. While the 14% develop a severe symptoms like breathlessness, even pulse ox will show a low oxygen saturation or more than 50% of the lung involvement in Imagine everyone will go for a CT scan. So in imagine you can come to know a 50% of the lung involvement, but there are only the 14% of the total uh, COVID infected patients. But the 5% of the patients suffer from critical symptoms of respiratory failure, shock or multi organ dysfunctions. At least we can say a third of a total infected individual this much patient will develop a critical signs and symptoms. I've just mentioned a little bit about a diagram about a major signs and symptoms. I have not gone into the de detail and the complications of any of the diseases. Just a rough idea about the signs and symptoms. Now, the common symptoms of the fever is loss of appetite, fatigue, loss of smell, shortness of breath and cough, coughing up the sputum, muscle ache and pain, severe disease, difficulty, and even walking. Patients become breathless even they walk in a one room to the another. They have a confusion in the mind bluish face and lips when they become hypoxic and shortness of the breath. When the lungs are involvement is more than 50%, there is a bluish discoloration and breathlessness. It's significant. When you cough too much, you are continuously coughing, you start throwing up a little bit of blood. Persistent chest pain, decreased wild blood cell count, and involvement of the kidney. Kidney involvement and the multi-organ involvement that come in a severe disease, it's nothing to do with the COVID alone, but it is because of the multi-organ involvement due to the severity of the disease. Uh, okay, fine. So now we have reached to the comparison of the symptoms. Uh, if we talk about uh, malaria, as I said, okay, malaria remained dormant in our liver for a year together, we can say. In so many places, even we know in certain places in Surat, uh, that area, everyone in each one is down with the malaria. So malaria have a different presentation 
in Surat or in an endemic area where a malaria is a very common illness. Any fever, unless it's proved otherwise, is malaria. But what I have explained is a book picture of malaria. Usually, the same presentation will be there, not included the complications. If you say about the dengue and malaria comes, uh, like if you have treated yourself from the malaria, it can come. You just need to eradicate the malaria from your body system. For that, you consult your doctor. They will go for the test and prescribe the medications, which were for the two weeks minimum to get rid of the malaria from the system. If we talk about the dengue fever, the dengue fever kept coming three, four times because dengue, we have the four types of a dengue viruses. One, two, three, four. In India, two and three is quite common. Four also nowadays we can see. Uh, so if you get a dengue fever from the one virus, fair chances you may get a second time dengue infection from some other virus also. So it will not give you the lifelong protection, but it gives a lifelong protection from that particular virus, the strain you have got infection, but you are again open to have infection to the another virus, which is two, three or four other three strains. Okay. Now let us talk about the dengue and COVID comparison. And throughout my presentation, I have just mentioned the important point, which is comparable. The most I have taken this here, the comparison of only uh, a symptom wise, the most common symptom of dengue is fever with an, uh, any of the following ache, pain behind the eyes, muscle pain, joint. And we have said seen the symptoms of a COVID also. If you see the headache is common in all the three uh, infection, but it's along with headache you just need to see the other symptoms also you have a nausea and vomiting is a part of a dengue illness here you will have a nausea and vomiting after the medications or the loss of appetite or you are not eating anything so you are getting the nausea and vomiting vomiting usually doesn't come with uh, a covid 19 you have a mild gi disturbances Symptoms of dengue last typically for two to seven days and here the symptoms for a little longer time also if you have to, uh, got the complication of dengue the symptoms there is no limit to it. Body pain and post infection weakness is present in both the cases. Thank you very much for all this your cooperation and patiently listening to me. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shakti. That was really very interesting to hear you. I mean, you explained it in such a simple, but in detail, everything, you know, which revolves around malaria, dengue, or even uh, COVID. Thank you for taking out the time. And uh, also what you really covered, I, it was very interesting when you spoke about, you know, the different three stages of malaria. Uh, cold, hot, and uh, the wet feeling, yeah, and also the four types of the dengue fever. And uh, taking it up next, now we have a lot of questions which are coming in from our audience, and yes. I shall address those to you. Uh, we have a yes. question coming in from Shashank. Um, his question is, how long does it take for a child to fully recover after getting infected with dengue? See, the dengue fever, uh, earliest presentation of a dengue fever after the mosquito bite is two to three days. Okay. And after se it lasts for seven days. After seven days, the fever usually subsides in five to seven days, but the rashes may last for seven to ten days. Uh, itchiness, if you are asking me the complete recovery, it takes minimum two to three weeks for complete back to the normal. But the pediatric patient, if they have not got into any complications, they recover much faster than us. But fever will go in five to seven days. Rashes will go around seven to 10 days. 
itchy itchy onness of the skin will stay 2 to 3 days after the disappearance of the rashes body pain weakness may last for 4 to 5 days so i can say the overall package of 2 weeks i can say but that also it's all depend upon the individual but i say that 2 weeks should be the fine uncomplicated thing you am talking about understand doctor thanks for sharing that uh, we have our next question from dishita uh, she has a question she wants to know which disease is more dangerous is it malaria or dengue no no i didn't get this uh, she wants to know uh, which disease is more dangerous as in is malaria more fatal or is dengue or both are, uh, can you compare both or yes. can you explain I, more I, about I, that i'll tell you uh, yeah i explain that in a detail uh you see malaria is also the death uh, of uh, uh, patients suffering from the malaria that is also very high dengue is also very high you have a no comparison like this because malaria usually can be treated is if it's a uh, um, uncomplicated and the opd basis we just prescribe the medication patient can go home if they are recurrently repeatedly expose themselves to mosquito and keep getting the infection and the repeated malaria it is a dangerous thing okay dengue i as i said the 80% of uh, children they don't have any issues they are mild symptoms we can say they can be treated at the opd basis we are doing that also but if they get into the another 14% another 20% 14% are with the uh, moderate infections then you have a no option but to hospitalize but as such it is very difficult to say which one is a more dangerous both are equally since the centuries are ruling over our entire world so they are equally equally king type the damage is equal i can say so either you take it for the malaria or in the dengue Okay. all right doctor next question we have is around you know the homemade remedies that people usually follow we have tejal who has an interesting question is the juice yeah. of a papaya leaf actually helpful to cure dengue no no such literature nothing has come till now as a scientifically proven this thing uh, about uh, like increase the platelet count by having papaya juice or having uh, uh, dragon fruits or the kiwi but there is no scientific proof is there okay because i have there. also heard of cases so in the made. past but yeah okay. the one thing i would like to mention you can prevent yourself from a mosquito bite by this is a home remedy which is you can take a one spray bottle full of water and add the strong pungent oil into that uh, uh, spray bottle and you can sprinkle a mosquito they don't like a strong smell so you can use the peppermint oil you can use eucalyptus oil even lemongrass oil cedar oil citronova oil this oil are market otherwise also available freely on the amazon you can put it in the spray bottle and spray frequently around your uh, area where you are staying on the mosque on the mosquito net on the window and all this is actually home remedy for prevention of getting the disease but no such food can increase your platelet count okay that's good to your doctor because i have heard of cases in the past you know wherein some kids have been hospitalized and parents are actually you know sharing things on whatsapp group okay where is a papaya tree available because they want to get the leaves out and use the juice to cure the kids it's a good insight you've given us today uh, yeah that is question. true yes yeah Sorry. and the ayurved uh, companies they are coming with the papaya capsules so but i am scared there is no scientific proof for such uh, papayas role of papaya leaves juice in a increase a platelet count no there is no proven uh, scientific details or study we have done it not okay. proven sure uh next
I think we have lost the contact. I cannot hear you. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Now it's you are audible. Okay. Uh, so uh, there is a question which has come in from Sushant uh, that he's been reading on the internet that there is a relationship between sickle cell anemia and malaria. So is that correct? That is true. Yeah, true. Absolutely true. Okay. Uh, yeah, sickle cell then... anemia, they have a different type of a structure. So the malaria cell cannot enter into that cell. So mm -hmm. even all the, uh, although you have a parasite in your system, you will not get the malaria. That is the truth. Okay. Next, we have a question uh, from Amol. Are there any special guidelines for using a repellent on children? Yeah, see the guideline in India, uh, we have all, all our repellent, they are writing everything in a detail. Even you can see the fabric spray or something available so they, it is a mention over there it will be effective for two hours after uh, the application so please follow this guide and after that the basic principle of this uh, uh, the commercially available oil or fabric care or some strips which is available is just to release the pungent smell Mosquito cannot tolerate the strong smell, so they will run away with little bit of chemical is definitely there. But the main component is a pungent smell. So over a period of time, the smell will reduce, then you will be again have a fair chances you will be bitten by the mosquito. So if they say okay, you are supposed to use it for the two hours, then please apply a second uh, round of the same repellent after two hours. So it is there. Okay, doctor. These days there are a lot of mosquito patches also available for children and yeah, adults. Are they really useful? Uh, to the extent it is useful because and but uh, I have seen the patient they apply the patch and they leave it like uh, entire day without uh, reapplications. Then you the fair chances you will be again bitten because the effect will go in a two three hours. So you just have to keep applying and see the literature which is available along with the patches and the spray or it is like, you know, Dio stick type spray is also available. So all you are supposed to how frequently they were advised to apply. Accordingly, you just apply. And the simple best remedy for the uh, infant or you can say a small children apply lots of coconut oil all over the exposed skin so mosquito at will cannot sit on it which i always prefer in the children less than one year of age because they most of the time they are in parents lap doesn't make any difference so you just apply the oil and prevent the mosquito bite Sure, we have a concern, uh, another question from Praveen Singh. Okay, his yeah. question is, uh, what happens if somebody is dengue positive and the TLC count okay. drops, it is decreasing and plus uh, COVID antibody antibodies positive is around 85%. <laughs> uh, true. See, the dengue is a viral infection. Viral infection, they always attack in our blood system. So in any viral infection, when the virus attacks on us, the WBC counts, the total WBC count, leukocyte count, what he said, TLC, they tend to reduce. Fine. That is a one entity you are suffering from the viral infection. COVID antibody means that you have either you have exposed yourself to the covid virus or you have taken a covid vaccines if you have antibody that doesn't mean that you are infected if you have taken the vaccines your antibody titer will be high fine so there is no relation of the total leukocyte count which is a low and the covid antibody you have exposed yourself to the COVID infection and you have developed these antibodies. So at present situation, when you have a COVID dengue infection and COVID antibody is not going to take care of your dengue, 
virus. He is not going to help you to treat the COVID infection. So I think I have answered your question. I guess uh, you've answered it right, Doctor. Yeah, it is a two sided entity. At present, you have a low count. That means you have a dengue infection. Mm. And antibody, you have previously exposed yourself either to the COVID infection or the you have taken the vaccine. Yeah, so there's a two different uh, um, entity together. Got it, doctor. Uh, next question we have is from Shraddha. Uh, she wants to know, is there any specific diet which you would recommend for a child who's suffering from dengue apart just from having medication? Yeah, I would love to. Okay, uh, see, first, I, as I explained, you first understand that in your dengue fever, okay, there will be the capillary leak. I explained that okay, your blood vessels will be very much uh, permeable to the fluid. So the plasma will start leaking. The water part of the blood will start oozing out. In that situation, your blood pressure is going to fall. Okay. So if you are, there are the chances that you want to take it everything. Okay, you just want to prevent the hospitalization. Correct. So what I suggest, okay, when you have a dengue infection or you are suspected to have some same infection, you have not gone for the test, child is feeling tired, keep the child well hydrated. Okay. So keep giving them fluids. Uh, a fluid is, we can say the electoral powder, but which is electoral solution usually is commercially available in the market. The test of that uh, electoral solution is not that good. So, homemade nimbu sherbat ya limbu ka shikanji, which is rich in the salt and sugar, which gives the energy also and prevent the uh, hypotension. The whatever the blood pressure has gone down will be will come up, which help. So, keep your child well hydrated. Any homemade food is absolutely fine with us. Whatever child wants, you can please offer to the child. We'll advise to give them a light diet. If they feel heavy, they will be more uncomfortable. Please don't force feed your child because of your force feeding. If child vomits, then our complications will increase. Understood? So keep your child well hydrated. Give limbu sherbat, which is rich in salt and sugar as much as possible as much as child can accept it light diet frequent diet okay don't give it too much heavy so like anything made up of maida it is it takes little time to digest in the system so avoid maida so baby child children should be light at uh, tummy easy for them to handle their issues so otherwise rest whatever we eat homemade no outside food it goes with everything and daily routine also and give the water which is boiled got it doctor the next question the next we question. have from Dinesh uh, he wants to know can an infected person transmit malaria to others even before the symptoms appear yes yes 100% yes oh. um, see when you are bitten by one mosquito. As I explain, the mosquito saliva will uh, introduce a parasite or the virus into our bloodstream. Fine. All the virus and parasite will enter into the liver and where they will multiply and release into the bloodstream. Minimum period for malaria after the bite and the appearance of the first symptom is seven days for malaria and dengue is a short is three days. If anyone is moving around and the second time he is bitten by the mosquito between a bite and seven days, he is blood is full of parasite or the virus. And when the mosquito suck that blood, they are going to carry a carry all the rich mature bacteria or virus or the protozo into their blood and when they go and bite someone else they will definitely give that gift to someone else 
so it is always a malaria patient two three patients in a one house dengue is the same two three patients in a one house because they are staying in a one room or in a one house and the mosquito are meeting from one person to another they keep spreading the infection in this way so definitely they can get the infection in an incubation period they are the super spreader when they you are in an incubation period as i said incubation period is a time of mus uh, mosquito bite so the entry of a virus in the body and the appearance of the first symptoms is an incubation period so in that time you are a super spreader you are spreading your disease all possible way got it doctor okay doctor got it thanks for sharing okay. thanks for oh, we have a few questions more which i will not take too much of your time now uh we have a question from shahz uh, his question is uh, should uh, children be given anti malarial drugs mm, it is actually there when you are traveling in a uh, endemic area or which is very much known to have a malaria so you should give there are the fixed drugs available in the market please consult your uh, pediatrician before giving that drug to the mark, uh, to your children we need to do the certain test for before giving that drug because the prevention drug uh, if you are g6 pd deficient it is not allowed to be given so please consult your doctor before you start this medication in any um, in usa if they are coming to india they are always on anti malarial drugs before they enter they start they have to start 15 days prior to the entry in india so they are always taking that drug okay okay interesting uh next question is from toshali she needs to know uh, is is there any such thing as malaria building malaria immunity and can uh, this disease malaria or dengue happen to somebody who's already you know fought against that disease yeah uh dengue as i said there are the four types of the dengue viruses okay yeah so if you got get infection from the one virus you will get a immunity from that particular virus but another three types type 1 2 3 4 so if you have infected yourself from type 1 2 3 4 you are definitely going to get the infection so you can get for maximum four dengue attack in your life all different i hope no one should get it but still oh. and the malaria yes relapsing malaria is very common malaria will not oh. give you a lifelong immunity even after having that Uh, uh, infection and malaria. There are again the so many types: P. Vivax and P. Falciparum. The P. Vivax is very notorious. I hate that malaria. Uh, they remain dormant in a liver for years together. When they find a favorable condition or the, any person's immunity has gone down, they come pop up. they are the different um, cycle of uh, malaria parasite and they remain in that that particular stage for quite a long time and when they find the favorable condition in a host they multiply from that stage you know there are the long stage long life cycle of the parasite stage 1 2 3 4 if we, they have stopped growing in stage 2 and after a year they find that ki okay, now the host immunity is low then they start progressing from stage 2 to 3 4 again so malaria vivax is like that so you after you finish your malaria attack please contact your doctor and take the medicine for 15 days from the ready for a radical cure and all these virus parasite they need host otherwise they die understood so if like malaria can grow only if they found a human body dengue will grow if they found a human body or the animal body if you don't provide them the host they are they are going to 
eradicate from the world. So most important, you should not let the mosquito bite you. Understood, doctor. Thank you so much. Doctor, as for your experience, uh, which are the cases you've treated more? Are they malaria or more of dengue? At present, if you ask me, hmm. dengue. Yeah. Okay. At present situa situation in this, this monsoon, it's flooded. I'm doing nothing but just admitting a patient with a dengue, dengue and dengue. <laughs> Uh, we have one more question, but again, uh, you have covered it previously. Uh, we have Joheb who wants to know what are the symptoms to identify dengue or malaria? Okay. Uh, see, the sign of a uh, dengue is a rash. Okay. So initially, you, there are little confusion for two, three days. If the child patient is having high grade fever, high grade fever. Continuous. So both the disease, they have a high grade fever. Both the disease, they have a headache. Malaria is a central headache. Dengue have a retroorbital, but the patient will complain of a headache behind the ears. They are unable to open the eye. They are the headache difference. Difference in a, a fever, usually malarial fever, if it's uncomplicated malaria, comes once in a 24 hours. And dengue is biphasic or twice or thrice in a day they get a fever, usually biphasic fever. Uh, see, chills and little bit uh, cold sensation will be there in any illness. But a shivering and chills is only with malaria. They even you give a comforter, blankets or the three, four blankets or comforters, the patient will not, not be very comfortable, they are still shivering, shivering. That is always malaria. That will not come with the dengue. I'm just talking about the initial, this thing. Nausea, vomiting, we don't count it as a symptoms. It is all the subject relative. And even someone is super in for even little bit stress, also they start vomiting. So that is a subject relative. But headache is specific in dengue and malaria. Fever pattern is specific and if you have a still confusion the confusion will be will go only when the rash appear rash is nothing but a dengue okay okay understood thanks for clarifying that doctor uh last question which we can take uh, is from abhishek he wants to know what are the common mosquito breathing sites which one can watch for common mosquito site if you see breathing. look around your breeding sites are uh, just so you look around in your house if you say the domestic plants uh, the pots they are the first even we have said that we have a ac which is leaking outside the water and we just put something uh, to collect that water they are the breeding site inside your house or around your area if you have a garden um little bit of water accumulation if you have some tap near, near the fountain or something little bit accumulation of the water they are the site which is around us otherwise if you go on the larger scale the backwater open sweat system they are the breeding ground okay and in the monsoon otherwise also all the water puddles are there they are the stagnant water and poor drainage system that we know unorganized urbanization the slope of a road is not proper you can see everywhere construction is going on so at present in mumbai you said the metro work is going on they dug up mm -hmm. all the roads so the more puddles there all yeah. are the breeding grounds on the corner side yeah, i can never understand there. understand so much. completely the only thing you can do is whether you have your thoughts or if you cannot do that, okay, at least the pour some oil on the uh, water. So mosquito cannot sit. Please don't apply DDT, which is not available nowadays. DDT and all is going to ha harm you, chemical. No, we don't want that. But you can save his oil. If you cannot clean and it's a large area, though at least just go and pour once in a day. Any type of oil should be fine. Got it, doctor. Understood. Thank you so much uh, for sharing this. 
thank you i guess uh, this brings us uh, to the end of our session thank you so much uh, dr tejal shetty for sharing your valuable time the session which you took us through was very enlightening we learned a lot from it you know there were so many topics you covered today and there's a lot one can take back and you know also implement it in their daily lives uh i would like to thank you doctor is there any parting message you have for the audience just please take care of yourself at least from the mosquito bite that is the only thing i would want to say treatment everyone will go to that consult pediatrician or the physician but this is important just save yourself my mosquito i can okay. say it's like in the centuries we are in the same same level i believe because before that was the ma malaria was there now also is the malaria we are suffering so we have not just got rid of this thing so now we can let us make a new fresh start and thank you so much okay. once again for your valuable time uh yeah it's a nice thing thank you dear yeah and as we come towards the end of the monsoon season i would like to uh, tell the audience uh, you still need to be very cautious and not let your guard down especially when it comes to you know taking care of your health and the health of your little children uh with this message we take your leave and we'll be back again for another interesting session soon until then stay safe stay healthy and take good care of yourselves thank you <laughs>